So, jetzt kommt der Moment am Tag, in dem wir von Deutsch auf Englisch switchen. We switch to English now. And we are a bit early, but I hope that's okay for you, that we start a bit early. Um, we are changing not only the language, we are also changing the subject, the genre. We started with fiction today, we moved to factual, and now we are going back to fiction. And we'll have an insight from Nuno Bernardo, CEO of Be Active Entertainment. And his um, presentation has the title Collider. This is the project he's talking about. How to create an entertainment franchise using a cross-medial approach to storytelling, using a live-action film, a graphic novel, an animated series, and a video game. A lot to take in, I guess, if the computer is ready, I would say. Nuno, the yes. stage is yours. Well, thank you very much. I didn't realize that I had such a posh introduction. Um, I'm just here to talk about what we do and one of our latest projects called Collider. Um, a little bit about my, myself. Uh, I'm Portuguese and uh, years ago I had this crazy idea of creating a company that could tell stories but be agnostic of platform. We didn't want to make movies, we didn't want to make television series, we didn't want to make games, we just want to tell stories. Um, and we created a story and we went to, with a nice pitch, we shot a nice promo and we went to all broadcasters in Portugal, cable and, and uh, free to air, we went to some mobile operators, internet portals, and everybody said, great idea, but no. And then, uh, after one year, being a salesman and, and, and going from one door to the other and collecting the biggest uh, pile of letters saying no, um, we decided to, we believed in, in the project, we believed in the idea, and we decided on our own to tell the story we want to tell, but in a new media that probably was not being used uh, to tell stories, that was the internet. So instead of going to television or instead of doing a movie because we were getting a lot of no's, we decided we want to tell the story so much that the best way to do it is to use the internet. So we start this blog, this video blog about this girl called Sophia and we partner with a teen magazine and we partner with an internet company and we partner then with a, with a mobile operator. Nobody was paying us, basically we were um, investing our own money, our own resources and we start seeding episode day after day, week after week, and suddenly this becomes a phenomenon. And a few months later, uh, the no's became yes. Uh, some of the no's, some of the people that said no, uh, and that I met them for twice, three times in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the past months or the past year, suddenly they called the office as they never met me before, as they never said no before, and said, I heard, I heard about this, I read about this in the news. This is, seems a, a very exciting project. Do you want to come in to pitch us a television show based in your property? And then I, I was about, I was tempted to remind them that I was there months ago pitching them a television series and they said no. But I shut up and said, yes, yes, lovely to go there and lovely to meet you. And then suddenly this, this small web show became a television series, it was broadcast in, in prime time in Portugal for three uh, consecutive years. Uh, it became a very successful um, book series. We published by now 15 or 16 books in Portugal. We sold more than half a million copies in this small territory. Um, we crossed almost every single media. We did merchandising. We, we, we had a deal with a licensing company, and this licensing company sold our brand to, I don't know, 20 manufacturers. We had fake tattoos, we had teenage girls pajamas, we had fake earrings, earrings. so we, we had almost every single product you can imagine for teenage girls. And then suddenly in 2006 uh, we got a call from, um, from Sony Pictures in LA and first I thought it was one friend of mine making fun of me and they said, oh, I've been reading about this show in Portugal, do you mind come for a meeting? And then a few months later they acquire the rights of Sophia's Diary, and then this small story, this small web show uh, was being bought by a major, and suddenly this small show that started in Portugal was remade in more than 10, 10 territories by now, 
and uh, it was broadcast in the UK, in China, um, in Latin America, and many other territories. Um, and since then, I thought, thank God people said no to me, because if they said yes in the first place, if the commission editor from a broadcaster in Portugal said yes, probably they will give me a check, probably they will buy my idea, but then they will change the teenage girl from a teenage boy, they will change the target, they will change almost everything, and probably a teenage girl diary will become a sci-fi series or something else, and probably will not succeed, probably will not get the audience that everybody expected, and will be shuffled after, or be shut down after a few episodes. Luckily, because I got so many no's, I was able to do the show I wanted to do, I was able to, do, to tell the story I wanted to tell, and not having commission editors or other people say, you can't do this, you can't do that, but just having the fans giving the support, giving the feedback, and giving us a harsh time. Because don't think that a commission editor is mean. Audiences is meaner than that, because they, they, especially when you have a show online and when you have a web series, they will tell you right away what you are doing right and what you are doing wrong. And even, you are supposed to know your story by heart, but they know better than you. Um, because if you do a mistake, or if you have something in a script that violates something that you established 100 episodes before, they will know that you are wrong and they will tell you and they will put in a post in, a, in your website or your Facebook page and everybody will know that you are a crappy writer because you don't know your story as better as your audience. And based on this model, we were able then to produce many other uh, shows, many other cross-media shows, transmedia shows from Portugal to UK, Ireland and, and Latin America. Some of them were very successful some of them were not successful at all, but I will not talk about the less successful ones, so I'm here just to talk about the ones that got a lot of success. Uh, and two of them were Beat Girl and Collider, the ones that we were recently nominated for uh, Emmys, and special Collider. But to go a little back, um, I think two years ago I, I made an exercise um, uh, in, this, in this coaching session uh, where someone asked me, why did you create the company? Why you, you do what you do? Um, and after a lot of fighting and a lot of effort, um, I realized that the reason that made me create the company and the re is still the, the same reason that makes me go to the office every, every day, that is to create characters and to tell great stories. And for me, the medium, whatever is a television series, whatever is a film, whatever is a game or web series, it's just a format, it's just a medium. It's not what motivates me. Because sometimes I do, I do talks like this for filmmakers or in film schools, and I talk about web series or digital content. And they say, I don't care about that. I, don't want, I just want to make a movie, or I just want to make a television series. And I think that is very limiting for what you do. Um, because a filmmaker is a storyteller. And for me, the story comes before the medium. And to be honest, you don't control the medium that your audience will receive your story. Even if you are a filmmaker, even if you say, I want to make a movie, you don't know if the movie will be seen in theaters, uh, you don't know if the movie will be seen on television, you don't know if the film will see it all, or if it will be seen in an iPad or in a very smartphone. So you shouldn't be worried that much about um, the format, but you should be more worried about your craft, about your story, about the voice that you have and what you want to tell to an audience. And I think that's what motivates us at, at, at Be Active, what's motivate uh, as at our company, uh, and less about the format. We, we do all the formats, don't get me wrong. Uh, the books, we do films, we do television series, but that's something that comes down the line because before and foremost is the story, is the, fo the voice of the writer, is what we want to communicate with an audience, unless it's about the, 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 the format. We try to, be avoid, to, to avoid to be Kevin Spacey when his agent called him and said, oh, we have this deal for Netflix uh, to do a series called House of Cards, do you want to do it? And he said, I'm a film actor, I don't do direct to DVD. And if you look now, um, you look at uh, what House of uh, Cards is and what he means for this industry and what he meant for his career that was falling, and you realize that it doesn't matter if it go to Netflix, it doesn't matter if it go to Amazon, it doesn't go if it go on YouTube, it just matter if it is good enough and if it has a good story and it was well-crafted. 
So what we do at, at, at Be Active is, as I said, start with a story. Start what is the story we want to tell, to who we want to tell the story, and then we usually develop a, a plan or a variation of this plan that is starting small and end up big. Starting small meaning we would never uh, start a project in, in our company said, I want to do a film or I want to do a tourism media series or I want to do this, I want to do that. We always start a project with a story. We want to tell this story or the writer, whatever is in-house writer or is an outside writer comes to us with a story and then Based on that story, we start to define a plan that, like this, uh, where we can start our story or their story, and we can start seeding it to an audience. We can get the audience's feedback, grow the fan base, grow the buzz around the series, and more, more important is test material. The filmmaking industry and the television industry usually has a long lead time, especially in, in Europe, films take five, seven, ten years to make since the original writer come up with a script until the movie uh, gets an audience in a cinema. And usually during this, this time, people is, are working hard, but never ever that material is tested with an audience. And later on, when the movie comes out, after 10 years of hard work, people realize that there was no audience for that movie. Uh, for us, this initial stage where we use social media, where we use internet, is very important uh, not only to create the necessary marketing and buzz around the project, but also to test the material. Because although writers um, and ourselves, we believe that we are God, that everything that we create is amazing, the reality is sometimes it's not that amazing and nothing better than sit it to an audience, see if they like it, uh, get their comments, and then if we are able to generate interest from the target audience, then move along and going from uh, a web series possible, possible to a book, develop a game, develop a television series, and, and keep growing the brand, keep growing the story, and keep expanding the story, and probably end up with a big television series or a feature film for cinema release. This, in one hand, allows us to be more confident that what we are doing will end up an audience, and also gives some confidence to our backers, to our funders, to our broadcasters, that when we approach them with a television series, we already prove to them that there was an audience that has been following our webisodes, has been following our blogs, has been following our social media presence, and gives them confidence that when this cross to television, there is a built-in audience that is willing to cross to another medium. So back to Collider. Collider, uh, it started as, a, as an idea that we had, because prior to 2008, we've been very girly oriented, so everything we developed was for girls. And I was uh, getting a little sick about the pink uh, and all the PJs and all the magazines and all the pink magazines and the pink books that were in the office. So we decided to go the opposite. We wanted to do something really manly, something that was sci-fi, something that was for core 80 to 35 audiences. And we came up with this idea of um, telling a story in the future, connected to the, to the CERN Collider experiments about the, the Particle of God experiments. Um, so we create this all universe and all this setup um, for the story. Um, and, and the reason that the, there is that lingo there is because I went to Los Angeles to pitch the story. And whenever you go to Los Angeles, you always need to pick two things because everything that is being pitched in, in Los Angeles is something meets something else. And in our case, we thought, okay, this is Terminator uh, meets Lost. Lost because it was a lost island and here we're talking about the future where people wake up in the future that is similar to a lost island and Terminator because there has a lot of special effects and lots of explosions and we wanted to do all of that. Um, and of course what we do also needs to have a reason not just for the entertainment but we also want to address something that was important especially on the drama side it was also a line that developed the story and developed the drama that was about second chances and what you could do if you could travel back and forth in time. Will you make different choices if you know the consequences of your act? So we had this underlying theme that was also for us important as storytellers because we will, this will allow us to uh, create some drama and create some backstories for our characters. 
And here is a little bit, a little trailer. It's not as good as yours. Your trailers look amazing. Um, we try to compete with that, but it's, it's, it's hard. Uh, we have a little trailer that explains what we did so far, or what we did, what we did until last year regarding Collider. Science has made the world what it is today, but it also has the power to destroy it. If the world collapsed, and you could go back in time to prevent it, would you make the same mistakes again? Would you sacrifice your own future for the good of mankind? Collider, a sci-fi cross-media adventure about time travel, survival, and second chances. An action-packed combination of science fiction, drama, and suspense drew the audience to the Collider experience. But to get to the future, we first have to travel back in time. It all started with the release of six digital comic books. As the audience moved through each book, they found out more about the backstories of the six main characters. Each chapter was extended with a short motion comic. The stories came together like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. Six people in an abandoned building in Geneva in 2018 with no memory of how they got there. The audience was left with one hell of a cliffhanger. Why did these characters leap in time? Soon enough, a prequel web series kicked off the next stage of the Collider experience. Eight webisodes featuring scientist Peter Ansay's attempts to warn the world about the danger of the Large Hadron Collider experiments. These episodes, combined with a Facebook fan page and Peter's log on Wattpad, would be the perfect entry point into the bigger Collider world. As the experience expanded, so did the level of interactivity. With the release of the Collider Quest game, the fan base had the chance to navigate through the CERN tunnels in 2018 and help the characters save the world. The immediate success of Collider Quest spawned two new games, a Collider game for Facebook and Codebreaker, where in a race against time, the players work with the character Luke to disarm every bomb in the vicinity. People got hooked and the brand grew. In the summer of 2013, live events at comic conferences and film festivals around Europe spread the word of Collider to more fans in Dublin, London, Lisbon, and many other cities. The Collider digital experience allowed the audience to engage with an intriguing story and helped to grow the fan base, exploring a new form of engagement, crowdsourcing. Applying a gamification strategy, the Collider Movement crowdsourcing competition compelled fans not only to share, post, promote, discuss, but also to become part of the creative team. Users were challenged to write their own scenes for the TV series, and fans could vote for their favorites. The most voted would be included in the final script, and the names of the authors featured in the on-screen credits. Months of community and brand building finally led to a four-part TV series depicting the group's last 24 hours in a world at war with unknown creatures as they try to reverse the wormhole, save themselves and mankind. With thousands of game and comic book downloads, Collider has started a brand with an unrivaled level of interactivity and engagement. A digital comic book, a graphic novel, a series of motion comics, three interactive games, and a fan-built TV series. What would you do if you had a second chance at life? After this, we also, we also had uh, two uh, feature film that was Open in Portugal in November last year, and uh, open in in, the, in Ireland in January this year. Um, this is um, what we call the, the Collider world, the story world. Um, we created all this story that is dated between 2012 and 2018. So we create backstory for all the characters. We create. Uh, the initial incident uh, inspired by the investigations at CERN. We fictionized that, that event. We picked six characters from six different parts of the world. We create their backstories. And then at the end of the story world in 2018, we put all of them together uh, in this abandoned hotel and they have a mission of trying to ignite the collider and go back in time and save mankind. Easy, easy task. 
To illustrate that story, throughout 2012 and 13, we produce a, a lot of content. Uh, we start producing a web series, live action web series, that then lead to a TV special. To tell the backstory of each of the characters, we create six comic books, basically what happened to each character before they wake up in the future. We create three video games that were inspired by the story, but they didn't ha have an effect in the story, so it was a way that he could navigate through the story world, uh, but without affecting uh, um, the, 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 the story. Uh, we had a graphic novel that compiled the last uh, days in the future, and then the TV series, and the feature film that was released in, in cinemas. So our strategy was to use the web series as dissemination of the brand. Uh, we use also uh, e-books. Uh, we, we had a partnership with Wattpad, that is a Canadian platform for e-book lovers. So we see there uh, a novel, uh, a free novel that you could get it for free uh, on this website. And with the success of the web series and the novel, we got the confidence and also the support from our funders to move ahead and, and to produce the rest of the content. Um, because we don't believe that if you build it, they will come to us. Um, usually, we don't create a nice website and we expect tons of people to come to us. So basically what we do is for each of our projects, we define what is our target audience. So. When we identify with where, what is our target audience, we identify where this target audience is. So what we do is going to these places where our uh, uh, what we want to be our fans already go. Uh, and in this case were sci-fi websites, comic book blogs, and comic book websites, uh, or sci-fi websites. And we went to a few of them and we proposed partnerships where we could see to these websites some content and exclusive, and in, in exchange, they will promote our content and our brand to their fans. Um, we did this uh, with almost 50 websites in both UK, Ireland, Portugal, and a few other countries in Europe. And these al allow us to start disseminate and start promoting the brand to what we thought were our target audience. Of course, we then extended this experience with a social media presence and we tried to, as soon as we activate the brand, as soon as we, we expose our brand in these blogs, that they, they will connect with us and, and Facebook was key on this strategy. And then we proposed to them uh, the download of our premium content that was the comic books and the mobile games. Uh, as was mentioned in the, in the video, we also did some crowdsourcing, not crowdfunding in terms of getting money from the fans, but crowdsourcing uh, for the marketing activities. Because we want, we, we, we already had a, a, a fan base and we thought instead of spending millions of euros that we didn't have to market the, all the other pieces, special marketing, the movie that was coming to cinemas, what we did was we asked our fans to do a few tasks like sharing our poster, sharing our trailers, changing their Facebook banner page with our, with our own Facebook. And each of these tasks will give them points. So we, we apply this gamification approach um, to motivate our fans to do more tasks. As more tasks they will do, more points they will get. And on each of the territories that we release the content and release the, the, the film, we create these collider movements. Um, and the top 200 are... Uh, the 200 more uh, active fans, the ones that shared more, that promoted more, uh, they saw their names uh, appearing in the credit, in the end credits of the movie. So it was a way that we could pay them off. Um, and they get an uh, exclusive T-shirt, as you see that in the photos. And of course, because they got that, they did more materials, they take photos of themselves, they upload to their Facebooks, and they created more, more engagement and more marketing. And I couldn't, say that this was key in our campaign. I, I couldn't say more that this was key in our campaign because in the end it was an a, a indie project um, and the campaign really allows us to take the project to another level. And I remember a, a story because when we opened the movie in Portugal, we, we, in Portugal we have the mainland and then we have the islands of Madeira and Azores. And we could op only open the movie in Portugal. We, we were not opening the movie in Madeira that is uh, an island outside in the Atlantic. And um, 
one of our fans was from Madeira and he was a little upset because he's been supporting the, the project from the beginning and he saw that the movie was not coming to him and of course he was not taking a flight to come to Lisbon to see the movie. So we approached us and said, what do you want or what do you need to open the movie in, in, in Madeira? And said, we just need some s local cinema or, lock or uh, to pick it up because we will give, send them the DCP. So what he did, because he was a big fan, he booked a local cinema for two weeks. He got a DCP from us and he did all the marketing for the local release in, in, the, in the city of Funchal for, for the movie. Not only that, that in the cinema, he asked us if we could give him the drawings and the original storyboard drawings for the comic book. So we also did an exhibition that was in, in, in one of the places in, in, in Funchal for one month, um, showing, showcasing all the, the, the work that illustrators did for the, for the graphic novel. He did local PR in the local newspaper. He did more than we could do, for example, in, in, in Lisbon or other cities in Portugal. And he asked for no money. He did that because he, so, he liked the movie. He wanted to see it so much that he was able to take the movie and then show to all his friends and show all the people in, in Funchal. And that is the power of an engaged community. Because if you do your work nice, and if you involve your audience from the, uh, as early as possible in the storytelling process and then in the production process, uh, and then later on the, on the marketing process, they will be your loyal fans. They will be your best marketeers. There is no money in the world could pay having a guy supporting our release the way he's supporting in, in, the, in, the, in this town. So the way we approach storytelling with an audience from an early stage usually pays off because down the line we ha will have um, a few, hopefully hundreds or thousands of very loyal fans that they will do an extra mile to help you to promote and disseminate the brand about your project. Uh, what I have here is some sort of a, a curiosity. Um, the, the poster on your left is the poster that I took to Cannes in, I think, 2009, probably 2010. Uh, at the time, we only had a, a few webisodes, and we had a promo, and we went there to try to finance. And on your right, is the poster that the Japan, Japanese release of the movie had, and now it's the, the cover of the DVD that will be released in January. And you can see how a project changed in five years. And um, I think they went a little over the top because we, we never provide, we never had that machine gun in the, eyes of, in the hands of the actor. They just photoshopped it and put a lot of machine guns there. Uh, they went a little over the top. But the joke is, and the, the most important part is this, is, this was a journey. And for us, every project, uh, as you probably will have your own journeys, every project is a journey. So back to story, it's important that we believe in the story. It's important that we like the characters because they will stick with us for three, four, five, six, seven years. Um, and it's important that you love the story, you love the characters, and you're not just focusing the format. Um, because then things will happen and then your film will be seen in Japan with a very awkward uh, cover. And because these brands stay and the characters stay with you and because you are so connected to them, they become your friends and then you can let them go. Um, so we, you keep expanding the world, you keep expanding the characters and we are keep producing content for the Collider brand. Uh, one of the things that we have in late stages of production is Collider 2017. Um, and this is uh, a spin-off project. In the, in, the, in the story timeline is a prequel to the movie. So it happens in Rio de Janeiro in 2017 with the character Lucia that was featured in the film. And it's what I call two in one. Um, uh, it's like that shampoo with conditioner. We had two things, uh, hopefully for the price of one. One is um, a tablet-based survival game, uh, and the second is a machinima-based uh, web series uh, with animation. The game was co-produced with a local company from Stuttgart that were students here in the, um, the film academy called Zeitland. And, um, and we use a, a, a platform, the machinima storyteller, that was uh, research and development project funded by the European uh, Media Program. And why this is important, and we are here in, 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 in the Film Academy uh, where um, 
There's also a course about uh, 3D animation. And for us, th this project was very important because what, what we were facing is, in one hand, there was this explosion of mobile gaming and, um, and, and, and the app market um, and the shrinking budgets. And we wanted to produce more content. And for example, for a, a world, a sci-fi world like Collider, it's very difficult and it's very expensive to produce content in, 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 in live action because you have special effects, you have visual effects, and usually it, it costs more. So when we, we approach the sequel for Collider, we wanted to do something that could be done with animation. But the problem was still CGI animation, traditional animation is still expensive. So what we did was try to combine both worlds of video gaming, because we were already developing our own video games for the brand, and try to use the 3D assets and try to use the, the advantages of the game engines uh, to create real-time animation. And for the ones that are not familiar with Machinima, Machinima was something that started, uh, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, where a few gamers start creating their own films based on the games they were playing. Um, and here is animation that has been produced in real time, because when you play a, ra a game, you don't need to render. It, it plays, it just, you just go from A to B, you just walk, you don't need to render each frame. So you can generate real time animation. Hey guys! <laughs> anyway, we are here to introduce you to a relatively new style of filmmaking. This would be the Machinima. Machinima is using 3D graphics rendering engines to produce computer animation. Basically, Machinima is using video games to make movies. Exactly. What you are watching right now is a Machinima. The term Machinima is derived from the words machine and cinema. The machine aspect shows that a computer or video game console is used to make the film, while the cinema aspect simply shows that there is a cinematic feel to the videos. To know more about Machinima, we feel it's important you know its history. About that time, eh, chaps? Back in 1992, Disney Interactive's game Stunt Island included a function that allowed the player to save footage and then play it back. The goal was to encourage user-created content. A year later, the game Doom was released, and it took the playback function a step further. Now the footage file could be larger and could be played back in real time. These were known as demos. In 1996, the PC game Quake was released. Quake offered even more modification options, and the demos were used in a similar fashion to football reels. Teams would watch rival teams' playback to find the best strategies for defeating their opponents. Then, on October 26, 1996, the Quake clan known as the Rangers released Diary of a Camper, the first widely known machinima film. This spawned a cult-like following, with more and more machinima films being released daily. The films were so prominent that they gained the name of Quake Films. In 2000, the website machinima.com was launched, being a sort of YouTube, but exclusively for machinima. In the same year, the mainstream media started to take notice of this innovative new style of filmmaking. In fact, Steven Spielberg used the PC game Unreal Tournament to test special effects while working on his 2001 film, Artificial Intelligence. In July 2001, Epic Games announced that its upcoming release of Unreal Tournament 2003 would include a matinee feature, which was a machinima production software utility. In August 2002, the first machinima film festival, which received mainstream media coverage, including that of CNN, officially took place. Machinima became even more popular when Rooster Teeth Productions created the popular Machinima series Red vs. Blue using Bungie Studios' incredibly popular game Halo Combat Evolved. South Park then released an Emmy-winning episode titled Make Love, Not Warcraft, which consisted of a Machinima made using World of Warcraft. Today, Machinima is being used to make many different things, including music videos and commercials. Furthermore, there are more and more festivals that are accepting machinima as a legitimate form of filmmaking. 
There's even an Academy of Machinima Arts and Sciences in New York that advocates, develops, and advances the art of machinima. Thanks, Tyler, but we have to move on. Blog me. So when we discovered machinima, we thought this could be a way that we could produce more web series and we could produce more content for Collider and possibly in the future other brands. But then looking at the examples that were out there, and you could see some of the limitations in the video that we're just playing, we realized a few problems. One was the fact that all these machinima examples use the characters and use the assets owned by the video game publishing. So we were not able to use our own assets. Uh, so we could use it machinima using um, one of the, the, the mentioned games to produce the series and producing the story we wanted. And then the quality was not what we expected. As you see, the, the characters move, move in a very rude way. It's not, it's, it's, it's not what we expect from 3D animation. Um, and then we were not able to import our own models, import our own uh, 3D uh, characters and 3D sets to create our own story. So this is why we create this tool called Machinima Storyteller that was a plugin for Unity 3D that could, we could use at the same time the same platform to create the video game for Collider and use the same assets, the same 3D elements, the same 3D characters, the same 3D backgrounds to create the, the web series. And that will allow us economy of scale because we could use the same assets and the same workflow and pipeline to produce two products, a game that we could sell on App Store and also a web series that we could put on YouTube or on the machinima.com uh, channel and network. And this is how we approach and uh, this is how Machinima Storyteller works. Everything again starts with a story, starts with a script. We import the script in final draft to the platform the platform does uh, what usually a line producer does, that is the, the script breakdown. So he imports the script, he reads all the, the headings and he knows how many scenes, what, where the scenes are set, identifies the characters and breaks down all the assets that we need. And assets will be 3D models of the characters, 3D models of the places, like the room, like the cafe, like the exterior that we will need for each of the scenes, and also the props that we'll need, a weapon, or um, something that the character will pick in one of the scenes, identifies all the needs that we need to do. And because we are doing the game at the same time, most of these assets are already in the Unity platform, so we just need to associate um, each asset to the, 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 to the script. And then we build the scene, and then what happens is when we do the animation, it just plays in real time, and the director of the, the, the web series just sits there, sees the scene playing back, character A enters the door, talks to character B, and sits down, and not like in, in 3D traditional animation, in, in CGI animation, you don't need to wait overnight to render that scene, it just plays. And then the director can say, okay, I want the movement to be different. I want to change the camera lens or change the angle. And then it changes, and then the scene plays again with a different angle or with a different mise en scene. Every single scene is then exported. We can do coverage, so we can have the same scene playing with a wide shot and then close-ups. Everything is recorded to the computer, to the hard drive as a ProRes file, and then uh, we can then in the end edit each of the played scenes and create our web series or our movie or whatever we want to do with it. Um, I have a few screenshots um, of how it works. Uh, I will go them really quick. So here we have a script for one of the, um, the, the webisodes. It's in final draft. The script will be imported. It's been saved on final draft. Will then be imported in the Machinima Storyteller platform and the software will then um, identify all the characters using the scene, all the places that the scenes are playing, and it will create some sort of timeline for each of the scenes. And then we need to pick the characters that we developed for the game and assign the 3D model for each of the characters to the, to the character, uh, and also do the same thing for the, the assets, and assets meaning the place where the scenes are playing. Let's skip this. And this is for us, it's, it's the most important part. Because we are not an animation company, we wanted to create a workflow or have a workflow that somehow simulates 
the set of a live action production. So basically what happens when the technician imports all the elements, imports the script, imports all the 3D models, the system will create something like this. It will read the action, uh, we will pick the 3D model character, of, in this case Lucia, we'll pick, we'll pick the scene, this was exterior night street, and we'll play the scene as it was in the script. Of course, because this is a machine, it will play as it reads. And uh, you see it in real time and the director says, this is rubbish, I don't like the, the way the character behaves. And then it can just give instructions to the character. It can say, I want it faster, I want more intense, I want more dramatic, I want you to smile. And because this is a virtual agent, um, it will read the instructions like a real actor and will perform the scene with the instructions that were given by the director. And then on the technical side, the director can pick the lens that you want to shoot, if you want to do a wide or you want to do a close-up. Um, the, the DOP or the technician can also define the lighting, if you want the light here or you want to light the background. And every time a change is made, it presses the play and the scene plays in real time. When the director is happy with why the, the way the scene is played, it, it's the record button and that scene is recorded for the hard drive. If you want to do coverage, you can record the scene with a different angle, with a different uh, uh, framing. And we've been using this for the last year to produce our uh, Collider 2017 web series that will be in animation. And this is just one of the playouts uh, of a few scenes that we have. And you can see the difference between the qual hopefully you can see the difference between the quality of what you saw in the Machinima story video to what we are able to achieve with the, with the platform. So every, every scene that is playing or every scene, or every piece of video that you saw that was played in real time in the platform. So you, do, you don't need to render every time. Uh, and we are able to achieve a, a good level of quality. It's not 3D CGI animation, but we were able to use it to produce the, the, the web series. And with the added bonus that the same elements, the same story, the same 3D models were used to create the game. And now we'll play. Some game footage from the tablet game. So with the, with the same assets we were able, and the same story and the same original content, we were able to create two products. A linear product, that it will be the web series, where you just play the button and you watch the, the, the story and you watch the series. Uh, or you can download the game and you can play the game and then it's an interactive uh, element where you discover the world, where you, although inspired by the same story, you can do different things because we don't control what you, what you play. And with our platform, with a, with a machine and a storyteller, we were able to do this in a very cost-effective way uh, when compared to doing this on a, on, a, on a CGI. And we are also thinking about using this platform for upcoming projects because we can use this for pre-visualization. So whenever we do a live action series, we could use this approach to do the storyboards and do the pre-visualization for the, for the series. We are now confident that we can use for upcoming uh, web series. Uh, and we also uh, allows, for example, if a company or ourselves, if you have a video game, we can import the models that we use in the video game and create uh, audiovisual content, create a web series or a television series based on the 3D assets that we use on the video game. And we, 
recently licensed the technology for a university in, in Australia where they are using it to do uh, live action simulations. So they are using it to do studies with firefighting where they introduce characters, they add firefighters, they introduce the situation, and then the platform plays in real time simulations how the, 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 the characters will behave in, in real world. So we, we are seeing a lot of uses for the technology that we develop. And for us, it was a way that we could uh, somehow overcome the challenges of shrinking budgets and the, the, the challenge of using new digital platforms to create and extend the stories that we love and, and care. And that's it. It's our two books are just do a shameless plug uh, for two books that I wrote about transmedia and the approach that we use at Be Active to create uh, stories and make the stories uh, stick around and expand to different platforms and, and, uh, and live for um, a few years and engage with an audience um, on the different platforms, and that's it. Wow, that was quite a lot. Um, I guess, should we sit down, should we stand? How oh, do we want to sit down? Okay, then please have a seat. Wow, um, that's quite a world you created with Collider. And, um, it started with a, I mean, it's not. It's it started with a real life web series, right? Yes. Live action one. Yes. So, would you say that the focus of the whole Collider um, world is now a bit changing into what we just saw, or will it always be also live action? I think it could be live action. We 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 are still in development of a television series that mm -hmm. pick the, the the original characters and puts them in another in another situation. But we always wanted to do animation. Uh, from, I think, 2004, 2005, we had a few projects that we thought, this is animation. It will never work as live action because the world was so, mm -hmm. so real or because the costs was, were prohibited. Um, we're, not able, we're never able to do animation. Bec the, cost, I the problem is, with our approach, you need to start small and you start seeding the content online and do 3D normal 3D animation, CGI animation, it costs the same amount of money, whatever it is for the big screen or whatever for, for the web, so we were never able to afford. Mm -hmm. This is why we spent the last two years, two years and a half, developing this technology that allows us to do more animation in a cost that we could afford, uh, special when we're talking about the web. So I don't say that this technology will, will, will um, be a substitute for 3D CGI, but in our business model, allows us to pick a story see it online in a cost-effective way, see if the characters stick, see if the audience responds well to, to the story, and then, probably later on, do a, a proper animated movie or animated television series because we proved that uh, it had traction online. So it, it, this was a way to overcome that limitation because we want to do more animation, and we are doing more video games, so it's, it's bringing these two worlds together. That is be, they've been separate for so, for so long, special filmmaking and video gaming, so we, we want to bring them together um, and try to use this economy of scale, try to use the same pipeline, same platforms, the same assets to do a game and to do a web series or an animated series. Are there any questions from the audience? Wenn ihr Fragen habt, ich kann auch übersetzen, ihr könnt auf Englisch stellen, wie ihr möchtet. Sonst mache ich erstmal weiter einfach mal die Hand heben, dann schicke ich jemanden zu euch. So, as long as there are no questions from the audience. Um, it's your duty now. Yeah, it's my duty, I'm happy to. Um, let's talk about the, 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 the story world of Collider. I mean, how important is it to create first a very, very good and very complex universe you have to work with in the upcoming years. I mean, I guess that sometimes if you work with a project, it's like, oh, we can do this and we can, we should do a web series, we should do a graphic novel. But first of all, you need a base for all of this. How long did the, the creation of the world of Collider take? We, uh, you, you addressed two of mistakes, two of mistakes that we did in the past and okay. we keep seeing producers doing uh, nowadays. One is how much story world uh, do you need to create? I forgot, I, I didn't forgot, I, because I, I, I thought I was running out of time. I took one of the slides from my usual presentation. 
and the, that slide usually says the anarchy years. Because we don't believe, because we did that and it didn't work, that when you start a project, you should create this huge Bible with this huge background story, with this story world. Uh, because you are creating so much content without you testing. So usually the worlds that we created, they are very, if you want, they are very thin. Mm -hmm. uh, Collider started like a 20, 25 pages treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, and then what I mentioned, the anarchy years, is that the market and the audience helps you to shape the project. Mm -hmm. The audience, because when you start seeing this content online, when you start writing a blog about the character, or when you, you put uh, a mini novel or a novel by chapters on Wattpad, you start getting the feedback. Mm -hmm. So that feedback helps you to shape the Bibles, helps you to shape what you will do in the future with the story. And second, the market, because we are a commercial company. Uh, if we are not able to sell, mm. we'll not do the project. Mm. So when we do the meetings, when we get the no's, when we go to LA or when we go to MIP or when we go to Cannes, when we get the no's or yeses or maybes, the feedback that we got from the, the possible buyers, the, the broadcasters, help us to shape the project. So these anarchy years is that limbo time where we, we put something online, we go to markets, we try to fund it. Uh, we don't know what it will be in the future, but we are just collecting information. And then is when the, the if you want, the story world is getting, is, is getting bigger, is getting shaped, is getting in place. So that's how we started. The second thing is that uh, we could do this too. That, I, I did a project in Brazil in 2008 called uh, Final Punishment. And he suffered from that. Because by the end of the project, uh, we had more than 1,000 pieces of content. And these 1,000 pieces of content needed to be released in sync because it was an alternate reality game. They needed to come out on this specific second because they were all connected and because it was a game, it was a puzzle game, you couldn't release clues before they solved the other. So we had to manage 1,000 pieces of content that they need to be released in that specific moment and it was mad. Uh, because what happens is, wanting or not, 90% of your audience will only watch or see the linear elements. Mm -hmm. uh, you are lucky if 10% of your audience gets engaged, gets deeper. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that we, you shouldn't innovate and you shouldn't do more interactive things, but be always aware that there's this balance that we are lazy people. We want something that is but easy to consume. Yeah, that's actually an interesting point because of the... Ah, they have a question in the back row. Mungin, that was fantastic. Can you share what inspired you to um, get involved with online storytelling? You told me earlier. Can you share that with the audience? Sorry. Can you what got you into the storytelling business, I think, was the question. Online. No, in the what online storytelling series? business. Yeah. Uh, Moving a, from TV to yes, online. Yes, it, it was the fact that... I always had two passions in my life since I was in high school. I always loved storytelling. I always wrote my own books and my own short stories from primary school. And I'm, I'm the, the generation from the personal computer. I always loved computers. And for me, the internet, when, when it happened, it was like, this is the most amazing thing that was ever invented. So for me, of course, it, it, it was, how can I bring these two worlds together? And, and for me, when, when I started the company, was I wanted to bring these two worlds together. And because I got so many no's from traditional gatekeepers, they basically pushed me into, into, into starting online. And I, I'm thanking, uh, I already thanked some of them in, the, in, in my past years because they pushed me there because I think it was the best thing that happened to me was to start my storytelling career professionally doing online because you learn so, ma so much, and, and I, I think I, I learned so, mad, so much. I, I, I did university, I learned to do short films, I learned the, the, the tradition about storytelling, but I think I learned much more um, when I was writing in the morning, shooting in the afternoon, and reading comments the next morning. Because you do everything, because you get instant feedback, you learn so much about filmmaking, about storytelling, about cliffhangers, about how to hook an audience, because it's almost filmmaking in real time. And there is no better school, sorry for, for Film Academy, there's no better school beside Film Academy than doing it uh, and have instant feedback and, and, and have your, your fans saying, but 
10 episodes ago and you said that she was blonde and now she's, she's, she's brunette. Are you crazy? Because you learn. You learn about rhythm. You learn about storytelling. You learn about cliffhangers. You learn about drama. And it's, 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 it's amazing. And, yeah, one more question. Um, so I think this is very uh, interesting regarding um, collective creativity, what you just said. Um, I just wonder what is the uh, problems that come with giving control over the story to the audience. Could you say something about that? Yes, I love to answer that question. Uh, it's one of my favorites. Um, I think that I couldn't understand the German in the morning, but I think mm -hmm. uh, someone mentioned it at lunchtime about this question: why the story shouldn't, why the was the, yeah, the, the, the first Dan uh, uh, dinner fox, fox dinner yeah. fox, why it should it be, why it was not more interactive? And Sophia's Diary was an interactive story. So we shot in the morning, we wrote in the morning, shot in the afternoon, published in the evening. And in the end of each episode, we asked the audience to decide what the character should do next. So basically, what they want to see in the next episode. And then we write in the morning, shoot the afternoon, publish in the evening, and go this five days a week, Monday to Friday. And when I, what I learned from there it was there's a big danger when you do really interactive stories. Because if you do your job right, if you write a really compelling story and you write really compelling characters, the audience will love them. So what they will do is to protect your lead character. They will avoid them to have it, to, to, him or she to get in trouble. They will basically start making decisions that will remove all the drama from the story. And then your story dies because you have no drama. So it, 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 it's very difficult to really create an interactive story because you are the storyteller. You are the professional. If you are a good one, you will hook your audience with your story. You don't need the gimmick of the interactivity. The interactivity, usually, that we use now, it's not to let the audience decide how the story moves forward, but how they can get different rewards regarding the story, not changing the shape of the story, because they don't want to do that, or they think they want to do that, but then if they do, your series is over because it has no drama. It has this amazing character that has this amazing life, drives this amazing BMW, and does these amazing things. It has this amazing girlfriend, but there is no drama, there is no conflict, there is nothing. Well, very interesting point. I mean, as you mentioned in our first presentation to, uh, today, ah, there's a ah, question. Very good. Um, as you said, 90% of your audience will not cross the line between the linear content and the interactive one. But what is your business model to the linear content besides bringing it to a full-length feature film into cinema? We, the way we structure the business is usually we, we give 75, more or less 5%, doesn't matter. But three quarters of our content we give away for free. It's free, it's online, it's on Wattpad, it's on YouTube, it's on different platforms, it's on App Store. We have most of our games are free because Honestly, I don't believe that people will buy content. People buy experiences. Uh, people buy something that they are connected. I had this used discussion when we were doing Sophia's Diary in Portugal with a publisher because we were having huge success in Portugal and then the publisher knocks on our door and says, we want to publish the books. And we said, great, we want to publish the books with you too. And then we gave them the manuscript. And the first manuscript was basically the, the, the blogs that we had online for free compiling a book. And the, the publisher said, I will not publish this because it's free online and nobody will buy the book because they can get it for free. And I said, they will buy this, the book because it's free online and there was this discussion and, and then we, we had a compromise that was, we were adding a little more story that was not online. And in the first week the book was released, it sold out three times. It was the best selling hit for this publisher in, in years because the kids that were buying, or the parents of the kids that were buying the book, they were not buying the content. They knew the story by heart. They were so connected with the story that that makes them buy the book because it was the experience of having the book, having the book in a bookshelf, bringing the book to school, showcase to their, to their friends. So that's how we, we structured our business model is how can we use the content on a different platforms, on a different ways, try to have people that are really connected with the content, really, really engaged with the content, and hopefully some of them will buy something. They will buy a ticket to go see the movie in, in cinemas. Uh, hopefully for the Japanese distributor, they will buy tons of DVDs of Collider, uh, or they will go to the App Store and buy our premium app 
that gives them extra um, extra experience um, because I don't believe in this idea that people will buy content just because the content is nice. It's like y y we go to a, a, a rock concert or a music concert. We don't go there for the music because we could go on Spotify and listen to music with more, better quality. We go to the concert because it's an experience and we pay 10 times more than the cost of the CD. And then, although we have all the songs on our Spotify, we are paying 50 euros to go to a concert, probably more in, in Germany. And then in a way out, the, the, there is a, uh, like a tent that is saying, selling t-shirts and is selling a CD of the band that we just saw and that we have all the songs in our uh, iPod or iPhone, but we'll buy the CD. We probably will never put it in a player. Probably will never take the, the gifting wrap around. But we want to own because that gives us like a memorabilia from that experience. And that's what people buy. And that has no price because if you have an, a connected and an engaged audience, they will spend the money. Speaking of money, where did the first money come from? I mean, for the, for the first web series, who was the first investor? Who was it made for, or was it just your own money? It was our own money. Okay. We, when, when we got a lot of no's, uh, we decided, okay, we want to do this. Uh, we do it anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, we go online, we have our own resources. Um, we were lucky at the time because we had a mobile service with, a, with, a, with an operator that was giving us a lot of money, so we could use that money to mm -hmm. self-fund uh, this production. And we were able to succeed, and then we'll, and then the money came in from publisher that gives an advance, from the broadcaster, from the licensing company, from the record label that then did the CDs, and then we start collecting royalties. And nowadays we still collect royalties from Sophia's Diary. Every almost every month I get a, a check from a publisher or from mm -hmm. distributed in Latin America or something. And mm -hmm. that's the beauty of of creating IP, of creating a mm -hmm. brand, is the fact that even when you stop producing the content. Um, checks keep being mailed to you because you have something that somewhere in the world uh, there's still people paying for it. Well, if there are no more questions from the audience, I would say thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, all the best for Collider. I mean, you have uh, quite something in, in uh, store for the next years. So all the best luck for you and thank you. <laughs>